Well, this is our last session, session 11, about life in Christ. And I always feel somewhat, somewhat awkward, somewhat diffident talking to people about life in Christ because I remember Paul's words in Romans 2 where he says, You who teach, do you not teach yourself? And to sort of talk to other people about how they should live their lives in Christ for anyone with a genuine conscience and awareness of their own failure, it's a somewhat uh, awkward thing to do. I don't mean by that that I feel I'm a hypocrite, but I, I can align myself absolutely with Paul's words in Romans 7 where he, he says, when I want to do good, the things I would like to do, the things that I would like to be, the person I would like to be, I find for whatever reason I just can't because he says that is, he perceives a, a principle at work within his personality that, that somehow puts the brakes on, that stops him from being and doing the things he would like to do. And so he says at the, of Rome, at the end of Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who shall save me? How to get out of this, this situation? And he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. And he has just explained in the preceding chapter, chapter 6, about baptism into Christ. And we made a real appeal in our, our last session for you to be baptized into the Lord Jesus, that then you will be in Christ and counted by God as if you are him, as if you are Jesus. That all the righteousness of, of Jesus and of God is then counted to us. That we are baptized into the name of God and of Jesus. And we saw it in, in fact, in our very first study, we, we touched on this, that the name of God is essentially his characteristics, his perfect character and personality. And that is counted to us. That's why in another figure, we are washed from all our sins and we are clothed with Jesus, with the, the white garments, as it were, of the Lord Jesus. And we spoke in previous sessions also about how salvation is by faith in this process, by faith in the, the counting of God's righteousness to us. And it is by grace, and we talked about grace, didn't we, that this is a pure gift of God to us, without, in one sense, any demand back on his side. I give you this because you've got to give me this back. No, it's a pure gift. And if we believe, it's there for the taking. And yet, where do, where do works come in? You know, James says, faith without works is dead. And yet, balance that against salvation is by grace, it's not of works, as Paul says, lest any man should boast. It's not of human righteousness. It is of his grace and our faith in that grace. It is of grace, Paul says, that it might be by faith. So then, what's the whole point then of, of works, or of any kind of attention to the life that we live? Well, I think it's this, that if we really believe that in both hands now I hold the hope of eternal life, that God has saved me, and that if I die right now, by God's grace, I can be sure that I will live forever in God's kingdom when the Lord Jesus comes back to the earth. If that is what I believe, that of itself will take a grip upon my life, my personality, my heart, my thinking, in everything that I do and in my whole worldview, that reality will structure the way that I am, the way that I think, everything. And so when we're going to talk now about life in Christ, this is not, not a set of commands that you must keep and then if you keep these, you will, you'll get eternal life. No. God has given us that eternal life already and that eternal life is in his Son. And so what does the Bible mean when we're, Jesus says things like, you have eternal life. That he's giving us eternal life right now. We're going to die. We saw it in session four that we die and we're unconscious until Jesus comes back. And then there's a judgment and we are given eternal life in a literal uh, sense at the day of judgment. So how can we now have the life eternal? Well, I suggest it works out like this. That in essence, the life in Christ that we now live is the life that we will eternally live. For example, to, to live in Christ means to be like him as far as we can. If we are living a life of kindness, 
of love, of joy, of patience, of love, of, of God's righteousness, if that's what we're living like now, well, that's how we will eternally live. So we are living, if you like, the kingdom life now, or we're starting to, we're trying to. His resurrection life, you remember we looked at this in 2 Corinthians, his resurrection life, the life that the Lord Jesus now has, is breaking through into our mortal flesh even now. That's what we, we read in 2 Corinthians a couple of sessions ago. So then, if for example, we don't like being good, if we don't like righteousness, if we would prefer to live a life of dishonesty, of, of stealing, for example, or, or, of absolute selfish self-indulgence, if we don't care about anybody else in this cosmos apart from myself, we won't have much fun in the kingdom of God because we're going to be living by God's principles forever and ever and ever. That'll be awful. And so, in a sense, the people who will not be in God's kingdom are those who actually it would be a punishment for them to be there. We are to love his appearing, the appearing of Jesus. Uh, and Paul says basically that all those that love his appearing, and you know, fair enough, that, it, that implies I think a bit more than saying, oh yeah, it'd be nice to see Jesus again. Uh, but if we love his appearing, we will be accepted of him. So then, when we're baptized, we saw in, in John 3 that this is a new birth, that we are born again of water and of the Spirit. And I said that just diving into a swimming pool is not just going to save us just because we're literally covered in, covered in water. We must be spiritually reborn also if we are to enter the kingdom. But birth is a natural process. The whole changes that happen to a woman's body as she gets pregnant as she comes to term, etc., psychologically, physically, there's something very natural about this. And as a child grows, there is something natural about this. And everything somehow falls into place. And so it is the same, really, with our spiritual rebirth. That it's not a case of, yikes, here's this list of commands, I must keep that, I must not do this, I must do that. No, it's not like that at all. The dynamic in this growth is the Spirit of God. That God is at work in your life, in your heart, in your mind. That God wants you for his kingdom. And so he will change you. But of course, we have to respond. And we said when we were talking about the Lord of Moses, that all those, whatever they were, 613 commands, have now been ended and replaced with the principle of the law of Christ. The law that is Christ. And we talked about what would Jesus do. That the essence is what would Jesus do. The law that is Christ. He as a person, as a personality, is my pattern. That is the bottom line of, of the Christian life. To be spiritually minded. You remember we were talking in uh, session 6 about the devil. And we said the devil is not some guy out there who fell off the 99th floor. But... The real enemy of all of us is our own fountain of, of thoughts, of evil thoughts that are inside us, temptation, bad thinking, that, that wells up, unfortunately, inside us. That's just part of being human. And we saw how the Lord Jesus had exactly the same, that what I call, as I remember, the echo, that we think something good, shall I be generous to that person? And the echo comes back, na na na. No, no, you, you need to just save your, save your money. You, you know, the world economy is really unstable. You, you, no, 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 just be careful. No, no, no. That echo, whatever you want to call it, the real battle is inside us. And I use the term, the violence within, borrowed from uh, Paul Tournier, that inside us, inside the believer, there is this battle raging. And the essence of it all, is to be, as Paul calls it, to be spiritually minded. To think and act in a spiritual way as we live in this material and unspiritual world. 
So then, when we talk about life in Christ, the life in Christ is the life that is focused upon him and copying him, allowing him to reflect his image in us. Of course, his uh, reality is reflected back by us in a a unique and individual way in, in every human life. He doesn't want a load of robots, but his principles, the essence of him, is to be reflected back by us to him. And we are mirrors, very poor mirrors, unfortunately. Paul says to Corinthians 3 that we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord Jesus and we are changed into that same image from glory to glory. In other words, insofar as we look at him and keep our focus upon him, the brightness of his image reflects back from our face. And it's alluding there actually to what happened with Moses who looked at the angel of the Lord that that had the glory of the Lord shining out of his face and this glory was somehow picked up on Moses' face and it reflected from him to the people of Israel and that is why he put a veil over his face. And it's in that context that Paul goes on to say the words we just quoted that we each with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord and are changed into that same image from glory to glory. In other words, bit by bit, slowly, slowly. And so, again, it is a natural reflection. It is a natural process. It is not so much a steel-willed grabbing of a set of commandments and saying, now I must do this and I must not do that. Even though, as we said before when we were talking about legalism, that is actually more attractive to a lot of people. But that is not the essence of life in Christ. We are a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And God created all that there is from his own spirit, out of himself, from his own power. And in that sense, matter, if you want to look at it this way, in that sense, matter was created. Once the whole thing was put into, into orbit, as it were, into existence, then you know, Einstein and all that stuff comes in. Uh, that the matter can only change state, it can, it can be created, destroyed, etc. But where Einstein didn't, uh, didn't go was the whole issue of the origin of matter. And that origin was with God. And so that same huge power that was unleashed at creation, that God said, and it was done. Let there be light, and there was light. And all these things, the whole of the, of the cosmos, the whole of existence, came into existence. That was all because of his word. And so we talk about the need to read the Bible. So far in these talks I've been saying, look, read the Bible for yourselves. It's the only way, because that's the only way you're going to find where the truth lies in all these doctrinal areas. And that is true. But when it comes to our personal transformation as as persons, it's even more true that God's word, the same word that could say, let there be light, and there was light, let there be life upon the earth, let there be animals, fish in the sea, etc. That same word that can create things out of nothing is operative through, if you like, the the black print on white paper, which we have in the Bible. As I said in session two, that book is not a book really like every other book that that we've encountered. Of course, the Spirit of God is not limited to to the Bible. I'm not saying that. that. That is sort of the only channel through which God is operating in human life. Not at all. Not at all. But all the same, it is a very powerful one. And That power, that word of creation, is there in God's word. And that's why we, who in a spiritual sense are completely formless and void and empty and nothing, that in our otherwise formless and empty lives, this huge power, this creative power of God can break through. That's why you can... can Meet a person who lived 80 years completely in a worldly way without God in their life. They finally come to the Bible, maybe literally on their deathbed or on their bed of sickness. And they read and read and wow, they are transformed, baptized, and they almost become persons 
for, for almost the first time in their lives. It's a wonderful transformation, and it goes on in the lives of every single one of us. The Lord is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, Isaiah 6. Without holiness, Hebrews, no man shall see the Lord. Be ye holy, God says, for I am holy. Quoted in the New Testament from the Old Testament. There must be an element of holiness in our lives. Now, what does this mean? The word, the Hebrew idea of holy, uh, the Hebrew word is translated holy. I mean, the idea is almost a double, uh, a double idea of separation from certain things and being separated unto something else. It's not just negative that I, I'm holy, so I don't do this, that, and the other, but it is I am holy, I have a mission, I have a focus now in my life. I am separated unto the hope of God's kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ's relationship with God himself. We saw in the last session how Israel were in Egypt, and they built these pyramids, they lived this dumb life in slavery, and God saw their terrible situation, the emptiness of their lives, and he sent Moses. And Moses led them out of Egypt, and then the Red Sea divided, there was water both sides of them, and then there was a, a cloud on the top, we said cloud is just water. So in that sense they were, they were baptized, they were surrounded by water, both sides of them water, water on the top. And so 1 Corinthians 10 Israel were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So then they came out of Egypt. That's like we come out of, if you like, this empty emptiness of this world, this Egypt. We go through baptism. And then we come straight away into the, the wilderness. And God fed them every day with manna. It suggested that the manna is connected by the Lord Jesus in John 6 with, with the word of God and we should therefore feed every day on God's word. They walked through the wilderness 40 years and then they came to the kingdom, to the promised land. But God says, I brought you out, that's from Egypt, that I might bring you in to the land of Canaan. So you see there this double idea of holiness, separating from and being separated unto. So yes, the way of this world is not our way. Although that will appear to you in, in a sort of, in a natural sort of way. That if you're there thinking about the kingdom of God, and I'm going to live forever in God's kingdom because I've been baptized into Christ, and well, I, for all my dysfunction, for all my failure, for all the bits that I don't get, he has saved me and he looks at me as if I am the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. I mean, these things will take such a grip upon us. But come Friday night, you really want to go out with the guys and sit in the bar and, and drink and, and, and all that? No. There, there becomes a, a natural change in our whole perspective, in the direction of our lives. And so I'm going to flag up a couple of practical things, just to draw your attention to them, to, to, to flag them up but not in any sense, as I have said, because you shall do these things, and if you do not do them, you will not get saved. If you do do them, then you will be saved. That is a far too primitive kind of way. We are waiting for the coming of the kingdom. We accept that God is in control of this world, that he's not in some cosmic battle with some other power up there, and that everything is moving forward towards the coming of Jesus to the earth, and the kingdom, <clears throat> the kingdom of God being established here. And so Jesus says, do not resist evil. Matthew 5, 39, it's repeated, Romans, Thessalonians, Peter, do not resist evil. Now, that means that we are called to act in a completely countercultural way. Because a natural feeling is self-defense and, and, and to fight for our worldview, even if it's, in our opinion, a good worldview, to come about. 
And yet there is, in the teaching of Jesus, what I would call a complete inversion, a standing up upside down, a standing on its head of all the sort of natural human wisdom and, and impulses that, that we have. For example, somebody hits you on the right cheek, Jesus says, turn the, turn the other. It, it's not natural to do that. That is totally counter-instinctive. He says that the true greatness is in humility. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, then get down and be a servant of all. And, you know, he washed the disciples' feet. He, he showed himself to be the absolute door girl who just did all the, all the washing of the feet. And that's, in his opinion, according to God, that is the way to true greatness. Now, that, that's totally not what people think in this world. And so this idea of not resisting evil is the same. Jesus says, if anyone wants to sue you and take away your, your outer coat, coat, let them have your, your shirt as well. It's in Matthew 5 again. Now, that means that really there can be no such thing as using force or violence in any form in order to get our way or to defend our rights. And I know that what I'm saying is, is probably going to be unpopular, particularly in some parts of, uh, of America, but I cannot see how you can justify in any form a Christian going to war. There is no such thing as a just war in this, in this dispensation. Don't forget that <clears throat> humanity, even our worst enemies, are made in the image of of God. Jesus says, all who take the sword shall perish with the sword. It seems to me absolutely impossible for somebody really with a, a genuine Christian conscience to be involved in the murder of any other human being. Even James says, don't curse people, don't curse man, don't, don't cuss people, because they are made after the image of God let alone murder them. It cannot be that a Christian serves in any kind of capacity that involves the taking of, of human life. And our community has a long tradition of conscientious objection. And I myself have defended a number of our, uh, our young, young brothers in various countries, mainly in Eastern Europe, in connection with their conscientious objection to military service. That is, we do not believe that our conscience allows us to serve in any capacity that involves us taking life. Because we have a conscience, a conscience to God, a conscience to his word. And of course, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 4, 5, 44. Now, you know, it's very easy to read those words, so yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, we said back in session two that every word of God is pure, and therefore David said, I, I love it because it's so pure, that this is, in fact, God's word. Now, if we are serious about our Bible reading, if we're serious about the Bible, that yes, this is the word of God, God says things like that. Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you. Well, we are not going to go and bomb the life out of them. That, that position is, cannot be squared with what we just read. And so, the way of human beings, Jeremiah 10.23, is not in their control. They cannot direct their steps. Our solution to this world's evil and this world's problem is the coming of the Lord Jesus. That's not our solution, it's God's solution, but we have aligned ourselves with his solution. And so it, it seems to me that it's not for us to be involved in, in trying to change by force or, or politics the situation that is there in this world at the moment. Of course, we are to be subject to the authorities under which we live. Romans 13, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. B 
Because of this, he says, you also pay taxes. Render, therefore, to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due, honour to whom honour. Although you've got to square that with Peter's attitude in Acts 4 when he's told, you can't preach. And he says, well, I'm sorry, but I'm going to do so. And they say, yeah, but you're not allowed to. And he says, Acts 4, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you go away and judge. In other words, I have to do what I have experienced of Jesus, which is to tell other people about him. You tell me it's, it's illegal, well, I'm sorry, sir, but it's like telling me that blinking is illegal or sneezing is illegal, I'm sorry, but I will do this, because it's quite natural in my response to my Lord. So then, there is a separation between us and this world. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world, James 4 verse 4, makes himself an enemy of God. That doesn't mean we hate the world. I mean, God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son to die for the sins of this world, to bring about salvation for this world. And we are in this world in order to be the light of this world. You know, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he also said, you are the light of the world. So we are to be him in this world. He has no other hands or, or legs or fingers or, or face in this world apart from you and me. We are baptized into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore we are him to this world. And yet there is, as there was in him, a separation between him and this world. It was clear that he was somehow different. And yet, on the other hand, he was so part of this world that he could, on that basis, appeal to men and women to live better. We've talked a lot about the Bible and the power that there is in the Scriptures. But this is God's creative power in our hearts, in our lives. And so, you should read the Bible daily. There's a little plan that... We're very happy to send you, if you send us an email, <clears throat> or I have some up here if, if you like copies, called the Bible Companion. And this is just a, it's not, nothing inspired, nothing particularly special. There's like a list of uh, chapters to read every day. And in the course of a year, you get through the New Testament twice and the Old Testament once. Now, I tried all kind of different plans, reading plans, etc. And I, I never, never kind of got one that was really satisfactory. And this one is also not completely the best, but... I, I come back to it after many years trying this, trying that. I, I come back to this thing, this, uh, this Bible companion. And so there's also a lot of people worldwide, <clears throat> thousands of people using this plan. And I, I rather like that, that uh, like today, I know that, uh, let's say I, I'm reading Isaiah 56 and 57 and Revelation 21 and 22. Well, actually, there's people all over the world that are reading those same chapters. There's discussion forums, etc., discussing the, those chapters day by day, etc. Job says, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Jeremiah 15, your words were found and I ate them and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. So then, regular Bible reading putting meaning into words, feeding upon God's word every day in a regular sort of sense. These are the habits which are the key, it seems to me, the absolute key to success in life, <clears throat> in, life in Christ. Now, talking about habits, it's the same with prayer. There's a lot of examples in the Bible of regular prayer. David, Daniel, <clears throat> praying morning and evening. I like to pray also before food, you don't have to like close your eyes and you know, all this formal stuff, but you can pray with your eyes open. Um, anyone who's driven a motorbike will, will, will know that you pray with your eyes open. Um, you, you can pray with your eyes open. You don't have to make a you know, big public deal of it, um, but pray regularly so that you're in touch with God. And of course, pray with faith. Now, we saw that the Lord Jesus was of our nature and we quoted Hebrews 4, in one of our previous sessions, and I'll just read it to you again. The writer says, <clears throat> We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. 
let us therefore, this is the whole meaning of that doctrine, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So the fact the Lord Jesus was really of our nature, tempted just as we are, and is now our, our mediator before God, we therefore should pray to God with boldness, with confidence, and really believe that with that kind of a mediator on our side in heaven, we will be heard. And yet I would warn us not to make prayer just a list of wants. Give me this, give me that. Well, I'll stick that on the list as well. Never know, I, I might get it. No, not at all. Think as you matured in Christ, you look back and you, you start to thank God for all the prayers that he didn't hear. Um, <clears throat> so think what you're going to pray for and don't just you know, give God a, like he's the rich uncle and here's my list of things I like for Christmas and you think, well, I might get two out of the ten. But uh, we should pray according to God's will. His will, bit by bit, becomes our will. And so it comes to it, as Jesus says in John 15, verse 7, If my words abide in you, you will ask what you will, and it shall be done for you. And yet, first of John 5, if we ask according to God's will, it will be done. So, through his words abiding in us, and this is why I keep on about the need for regular exposure to God's word in reading it daily, if his word abides in us, our will becomes God's will. You ask according to God's will and you get it. You ask according to your will, if God's word abides in you, and you get it. But that means, of course, that you don't ask for all sorts of dumb things. Like, you know, I remember when I was a little boy, like, please God, I've shut my eyes now, when I open my eyes, please may I see a, whatever it was, 10 quid note or whatever, lying on the ground in front of me. And like, God never answered my prayers. Um, or like walk out lampposts, say, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to fall over, like I wasn't worrying about where the lamppost might fall over on. You know, uh, and we might uh, sort of raise our eyebrows about that kind of thing, but all the same, we, we're not much different today. We ask for the most inappropriate things. So, regular prayer, praying according to, to God's will. And of course, as we've said, we are the light of the world. He has, Jesus has no other face in this world apart from, apart from you and me. Now, that means that witness is important. But, as I say, it is a natural thing that people see in us something of Jesus. But there's no reason, of course, why we should not, in a more sort of conscious way, try to take that message to other people. Now, I carry in my pocket these little calling cards, and it doesn't say much, it just says, what is the gospel? And uh, it's got my email address on it, and I just litter uh, the place with these things. Like I'm sitting on, a, on transport or sounding on a bus or something, I, I leave one of these on the seat. I mean, I, you might not think that's your way, and it doesn't have to be your way at all. But I like to feel myself that every day I have at least tried to share the message with somebody, to talk about it with somebody. Because, I mean, Jesus is going to come back, and we believe he's going to come in our lifetimes, and you and I are going to live forever in his kingdom. Now, it's going to be pretty weird if when the Lord comes back, all the people that have known me or known you, wow, suddenly, oh, that fella, he's one of them. You know, Jesus said two men will be in the field and one will be taken and the other will be left. There'll be two women working together. One gets taken, the other left. And people are going to be like, well, what happened? This Jesus has come back and he was one of them? Well, why didn't he tell me anything about it? Wow, he's got eternal life now. Why the guy didn't tell me anything about that? And I know we're not saved because we've been good preachers, but I'll be honest, I worry about that, that I mix with people who don't really know that hope that I have. They just know me as that Duncan guy. And, you know, we should be trying to share this hope with others and pray, pray every day that God will lead you to someone that somehow the conversations will pan out in such a way that you have the chance to make a witness. 
that you just make the right connections with people. Now, there's something else that God asks of us very specifically in our lives. <clears throat> he asks baptism for us, uh, of us, and I said that it's maybe psychologically because he doesn't want us to just drift into faith. We have to make a, a conscious one-time decision that I am for him. And there's one other thing that he asks, and that is the breaking of bread. And you may like to have a read sometime through the first of Corinthians chapter 11, where the whole thing is, is explained to us, that the bread is a symbol of the body of Jesus and the wine is a symbol of his blood. And in chapter 11 of Bible Basics, you can read some suggestions about how you can break bread. And you can do this on your own or with other believers. Of course, it's better to, to meet together with others who believe the same things as you do and have been baptized and do this together. But you can also do it on your own. You can do it anywhere. I mean, I've done it on long train journeys, uh, sitting on long distance buses, anywhere. You, you, you can do this. Of course, you try to use wine, uh, red wine as a symbol of the blood of Jesus and, and bread as a symbol of his body. But actually, you know, the essence is that we are remembering him and whatever we have to use, we have to use. Hebrews 10, 25, let us not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day, the day of the second coming of Jesus, all the more as you see the day approaching. So then, it's a good thing to meet together with others who believe as we do, because we collectively, as well as individually, are the body of Christ. It is important that Christianity is not designed to be lived on our own, to be lived in glorious isolation. A guy sitting in his apartment, reading the Bible on his computer, believing that, yep, yep, this is all good stuff, yep, I believe that, okay, I've been baptized, and that sort of period, like, don't get involved in my life anymore. No, the whole idea is that we are taking energy from others who are in Christ and giving to them. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, and my yoke makes the burden easy. Now, the idea of a yoke is that, like, the different oxen got underneath the yoke, and the, the yoke as a whole split up the, the heavy weight they were pulling between them. And so Jesus says, I'm a yoke. I'm a connector. I'm a networker in uh, modern sort of jargon. I'm a yoke. I'm connecting all of you together so that the yoke makes the, makes the burden lighter. It's not actually that he, he lessens the weight of the whole thing. It's just that he's a yoke and therefore he puts us in a situation whereby the overall weight is far lighter because we have others to pull with. And so that's why fellowship together is so important. And the whole idea is that the grace and love that we have received from God, we share with others. And how are you going to get any practice at patience, forgiving, working together to God's glory? How are you going to get any practice for that if you're not together with others who believe as you do in some form of community? But of course, it's very really difficult for a lot of us to to actually want to be in community. We're all such individualists, uh, particularly in this uh, generation in which we live, with you know, small, family, small families and individualism as, as the order of the day. But in Acts 2, we're told that when the early believers were baptized, they continued meeting together, breaking bread together, fellowshipping together, preaching together. They were together. And so... I really do encourage you to, to get in touch with other believers, whatever you are, and to fellowship together. And you know here in the, in the Riga Bible Center, we're meeting here Sundays, 1 o'clock, you, you, you know that, for, for the breaking of bread. And if people are looking at this uh, online, you're also welcome to contact us, and we'll put you in touch with local brothers and sisters where, wherever you are. So then... There's a lot of specific Bible teaching about marriage and relationships. And again, I think a lot of this, as I said earlier, comes kind of naturally. 
uh, because we are redeemed in Christ. We have seen the great love that he has shown to us. And that is to be, it should be naturally reflected in our relations with other people on all levels. So then, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says that in a marriage, the man represents Christ and the woman represents the church, those who have been redeemed in Christ. Now that is not to say that the, you know, the bloke is somehow uh, better than the woman or that she better just do what, what he says. That's not the point. It is a, a figure that he's using and all figures break down if you, you, you push them to, to, too far. But the point is that the love that was shown and is shown by the Lord Jesus to us should be reflected by the man to his wife and in the same way as the church, the believers, grasp with both hands that love of, of Jesus and give all for him and for the, the good, if you like, of his name and, and the, the new family that we're creating in Christ, so that is the response of the woman. Now, that's an ideal. We all fail, like I started off by saying, we all fail miserably in responding to, to the love of God and to the, the standards which there are. And God recognizes that. God does recognize that. And he recognizes that in the whole field of human relationships particularly. I suggest you have a look then at chapter 11 of Bible Basics for some thoughts. Some thoughts about that issue. If, it, if it's something that you find relevant to you. And of course for most of us we are in relationships, married etc., uh, and, and have family responsibilities. I'll leave you to, to go through that at your, own, at your own pace. So then, to sum up then, we have emphasized that we are in Christ. And that means that God counts us as if we are him. And that is the bottom line. Life in Christ means living, believing that that is the case. I mean, Jesus is to be the light of our world. You know, the light defines everything for us, doesn't it? Uh, and so he is to be, as it were, everywhere in our lives, defining how we see absolutely everything. Paul says, in, in a wonderful way, I think, to me, to live is Christ. To live is is Christ. And I, I think in that very you know, short form, highly in, intense kind of use of language, he's trying to say that life is for me Christ. He is the life. You know, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, this I guess was also what he was driving at. That for us, he as a person is to be the whole way of life, the ultimate truth of life, and the life that we live. And as I said at the beginning of this session, in that sense, in that sense, we have the eternal life now. We are now living in, in our spiritual life, we are living the kind of life that we will eternally live. And that is life in Christ.